Well, good morning and welcome to the Solaris webinar on making sense of where to invest in Australian equities in 2019. My name is Mark Cormack and I'm a director with Pinnacle Investments. Pinnacle works alongside Solaris to distribute their investment capabilities to the Australian financial advisory marketplace. And today we're going to be joined by the Solaris long short team of Damien Coyney and Gus Roberts to take you through where they see the Australian equity market from a long short perspective in 2019. In terms of background, Solaris and Australian equity fund management boutique have delivered outperformance over the ASX 200 in 16 out of 18 years. And with this outstanding track record, Solaris are one of the only fund managers who truly back their investment capability by having their core performance alignment fund with a zero MER fee. And they only charge a performance on this fund when they outperform the index. In addition, Solaris also run a highly successful Australian Equity Long Short Fund, which has recently been crowned Fund Manager of the Year for Long Short Investing by both Lonsec and Zenith. Solaris adopt a style neutral approach to investing in Australian equities, meaning they're not going to be held hostage to a growth or value style, and it's meant that they have outperformed and delivered some outstanding investment results in different market conditions. Like all the boutiques within the Pinnacle suite, the Solaris team own the majority of equity within their fund management business. But equally important is that the Solaris team have a stable investment team, with the core of that investment team having worked together for well over a decade. In terms of performance, I'm delighted to say that the team's outstanding track record has continued across all funds, and especially the Solaris Long Short Fund has delivered over 7% outperformance over the ASX since its inception. Before we start today's presentation, just a reminder that all attendees have the opportunity to ask questions, and this can be done by clicking the questions tab on your screen. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to the Solaris Long Short team of Damien Coyney and Gus Roberts for today's presentation. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, just quickly, for anyone new, I might start with a bit more detail about us. Uh, we are a style neutral manager, and we pick stocks using bottom-up fundamental analysis to help exploit market inefficiencies in both forecasts and valuations. So style neutral means I'm not beholden to a particular investment style or cycle, and we see growth, value, and many other factors as potential source of investment returns, and that's both long and short. We are an experienced team. Uh, we have been investing together now for well over a decade, uh, and we have seven empowered analysts who are the experts for the stocks within their allocated sectors. Now, this is where we're a little bit different to our peers. We think the analyst, rather than a PM, is best placed to weigh up an investment as they are most familiar with the stocks. Now, this approach has served us well over the years, delivering a very diversified portfolio driven by stock picking, while avoiding the top-down risks which can inadvertently dictate portfolio returns. This approach to portfolio management has consistently produced alpha in 16 of the last 18 years, and we are proud to say that our flagship core fund uh, is currently ranked in the top quartile across all time periods within the survey. On to the next slide. This chart, we think, highlights the objective of our long short fund really quite well. So it's a true extension fund it leverages off our successful long-only core fund and it benefits from its near 20-year existence. So it utilises all of this IP, the same investment team, as well as the same investment process. As our previous slide detailed, our core fund has a long history of consistently delivering alpha, and that's year in, year out. With our long short fund, we're able to amplify these consistent returns through shorting and monetising our negative views on stocks. Shorting then also provides the low-risk capital which we can reinvest into our high-conviction long ideas, grossing up the position sizes, which adds further alpha to our investors. In our 13030 fund, we seek to offer higher potential returns than our long-only product, and that's across all market conditions. So with that, I'll pass over to Gus to talk about the current state of player markets. Thanks, Damien. So over to the next slide. Um, and as we have witnessed this week, the shock uh, election result has really given 
the Australian market a big shot of an adrenaline and the index now trading at 11 year highs which is uh, quite remarkable. Uh, we've seen the banks and domestic cyclical stocks, they've been clear beneficiaries. But if we take a step back for a moment from the euphoria, we're going to firstly review reporting season to get a good understanding how corporate Australia is travelling. As it was in statistical terms, February was actually one of the worst reporting seasons post-GFC. Nearly 50% of companies within the ASX 200 witnessed negative earnings revisions. And as you can see from that bottom right-hand chart, nearly every sector, well every sector within, with, with the exception of mining actually witnessed earnings downgrades. Many of these misses were due to rising costs and pretty poor outlook statements. So it's clear corporate Australia is experiencing some uh, pretty challenging conditions. But given February is firmly in the rear vision mirror, why are we still talking about it? Well, we sort of believe that it still stay, uh, lays the foundations for the next few months. Despite the election, we think there is still significant risk to second half earnings. And in fact, the list of companies that we believe are overly optimistic in their forecasts is the largest we've seen in many years. So how can we profit from these market moves? Well, um, initiating some outright shorts is a good start. So I suppose very quickly then, what are the outright shorts? So just to explain them in a bit more detail, these are your more traditional event style shorts, so stocks that we expect to outright fall in price. Um, they likely fail our initial screens, so just onto the next slide. Um, they have earnings risk or are simply overvalued. They are generally short of shelf life, uh, higher turnover, and are your more catalyst driven shorts and reporting season can be a large catalyst. So this chart here highlights how much earnings risk there has been in the industrials over the last four months. So the Anders community, um, if you look at the blue line, you can see they started the year looking for a bit over 5% growth in the industrial uh, space, but ended up downgrading expectations to just 1% post-February, which is where we currently stand. So the outright shorts can take advantage of this poor earnings momentum. So we can target companies that we believe are overvalued and have earnings risk, or in other words, are essentially not priced for any disappointment. But in saying that, we're also very quick to take profits in these trades. Uh, one, because the bad news is typically priced in almost immediately, and two, because uh, the time in the market is not really your friend with these type of shorts. So in some examples that we've been short before, they can be in high quality growing businesses or a high in the love index, meaning it's very hard to stand in front of the momentum with that really callous for your short. And outside of reporting season, May, so the month we're in at the moment, it typically sees the largest number of profit downgrades, given firms have a sort of a greater clarity around trading conditions into the end of the year. Um, despite the election, we believe it's going to be difficult for firms to meaningfully turn things around before the end of the year and still expect to see a heightened level of downgrades. This is the time for these outright shorts to shine, and we have been focusing on companies that are in a downgrade cycle, are reliant on a... Um, unrealistic second half contribution to achieve their estimates and um, as well as margin expansion is the primary driver. Look, we've had um, a lot of success in these, in these outright shorts more, more, more recently, but um, they are not our main game. Sure, they're a great way of monetizing a negative view, but we are the first to admit they are a more risky way to add alpha to the process. There is obviously a place for them um, in our portfolio, but we think it is far easier targeting some of the other categories, categories the funding and the pairs trades, where the hurdle for success there is, is much lower. So those other categories are simply trying to liberate capital cheaply and efficiently and safely, and then we reinvest those proceeds into our preferred longs. So on to the next slide, and this is where we'd like to highlight that our approach to shorting uh, we think is fairly unique, um, and again, just to reiterate where our main objective is just to compile a very low risk and diversified short portfolio. So some traditional um, funds in the space have exhibited quite high risk profiles, um, and that's certainly not our approach. 
So internally here, once a short is identified, we first group it into uh, one of those three categories. Uh, we decide whether it's an outright funding or a paired trade. And we do this because we think it broadens uh, the potential alpha streams. So categorising the shorts opens up a much larger shorting universe. It allows us to put more emphasis on the short category that we think is more relevant uh, for the time and the cycle. Um, and then secondly and more importantly, it helps us to manage risk. So we all know that risk comes in many shapes and forms, but specific to shorting, it helps us avoid concentration risk or short squeeze risk, which is really prominent in those outright shorts. Yeah, so look, one of the biggest myths of long short investing is that you need to be uncovering the next train, train wreck. Think uh, retail food group, total reject shop, uh, Slater and Gordon and the like. Um, many of our peers take this approach. Well, it's certainly not our mantra. These trades don't come around too often, number one, and many shorts, particularly the traditional outright shorts, become pretty well known. They become pretty well, uh, pretty popular from the short side um, and they can become very crowded and prone to short squeeze risk. We think it is far easier targeting the other categories, categories rather, such as the pair trades and, um, and, and the funding trades where the hurdle for success there again is, is much lower. So on to the next slide, and we'll just focus a bit on the pairs today. Um, so what are the pairs? Well, pairs trades are essentially an opportunity to exploit mispricing between two stocks uh, without taking on the common top-down risk that is evident in both the names. So they are a long and a short. They're usually in the same industry. Uh, they're usually homogenous, but become mispriced relative to each other. Now, just to explain that in action, um, we have Charles Story here, who is the uh, analyst for the bank sector, and he'll give an example today of a pairs trade where we are short Bendigo paired against a long or longs in the majors. Yeah, thanks, Damien. So um, that pairs trade uh, is predominantly on our view that uh, in the banks you need economies of scale, um, and and. The regionals, being Bendigo and BOQ, um, are really suffering in terms of that relative to the majors at the moment. So more increasingly you need a greater technology capability within the sector and the majors have the budgets and the balance sheet to be able to spend and get the best technology out there in the market. And, and at the moment we view the infrastructure that Bendigo and BOQ are offering is, is sort of sub what the majors can do. And it's also becoming more and more important to have that economies of scale when NIMS, so the bank net interest margins are under pressure. And um, that economies of scale enables the banks to get sort of much cheaper sources of funding. And the BOQ and Bendigo's and the smaller guys are paying much more for their cost of funding at the moment. And we look at the sector more broadly. Um, there's obviously been pretty big implications this week uh, from the elections on the weekend. Um, and obviously the majority of our listens, listeners will be aware that uh, the policies that Labor were carrying into the election were pretty negative for the banks. And we've seen the banks rally pretty hard this week. Um, and, and so we think um, that the sector has changed quite a bit this week. Um, previously to this week, the market was very worried about tail risks within the, within the sector. And by tail risks, I mean sort of a deterioration in housing, um, from some of those labour policies and asset quality really deteriorating and then for the bad debt charges that the banks carry increasing. And we think that tower risk um, has now essentially been eliminated and it's much less likely to happen. And that's why we've seen that big rally occur in the banks this week. And it's also important when we think about it to understand where the market is positioned. So the majority of long-only funds in Australia, the active managers, our peers, have been dramatically underweight the sector. And, and there's also been quite a bit of short interest. So we've seen both of them sort of this week and it will probably continue having to neutralise to some degree those positions. And we also had an appointment, important announcement this week from the regulator. They've loosened um, some of the uh, regulations around banks uh, and that should help credit, specifically in residential housing, uh, improve a little bit. 
Um, so the banks, it's important to think the banks are not particularly cheap at the moment. Um, if we look at CBA, it's trading currently on 15 times earnings. That's pretty close to its long run average. And we've seen ROEs come down a lot, in, especially in the last four years. So CBA, for example, had a return on equity four years ago of 18.8%, and today it's currently closer to 14, 14.5%. So it probably shouldn't trade at the higher P's that it has in the past, and, and it's getting pretty close. So we're not um, uh, calling for a large overweight position in the banks, but definitely that downside risk has abated, and so that's how we're thinking about the sector at the moment. And while you have the floor, Charles, do you want to continue talking to the, the last slide of today? Sure. So if we think about uh, our view on resources at the moment, obviously in uh, February there was that very tragic um, dam accident uh, that happened to Vale in Brazil. So what that's done, it's caused pretty big, large short in the iron ore market. And so there's been about 3 to 5%. Uh, of the seaborne iron ore supply, which has been taken out. Um, and that's caused the iron ore price to rally pretty hard. It's now above $100 at about 105 and sort of at the start of the year we came in um, in the mid-60s. And the view of the market at the start of the year was iron ore was going to be drifting lower. So we have a preference for the majors, Rio and BHP, where we're ever at both those stocks at the moment. They're generating very strong free cash flow. And uh, the other thing that we think is very important is they still have a lot of capital discipline. So the errors of their ways from the previous cycle um, is still entrenched in the current management teams. And we view a lot of that free cash flow will be coming back to shareholders. And there's no mandate for these majors to do large scale M&A at the moment. So we think that's quite a, even though they have rallied um, you know, quite a bit in the, in the last three or four months on the back of this iron ore. We, we think that looks quite a decent place at the moment, those majors. And then the other sector, um, telcos. So there's quite a bit going on in the telco sector at the moment as well, obviously uh, with the Vodafone um, and TPG merger being locked, knocked back by, um, by the ACCC. We think that's quite a positive for Telstra. They've also had a benefit from the federal government decision to ban Huawei, so the Chinese 5G infrastructure provider. And that plays quite well into Telstra's hands. They actually don't have any Huawei equipment, whereas Vodafone especially, and Optus a little bit, carry quite a, a little bit of that, that equipment. And they will then have to change vendors and it will cost them quite a bit to implement and roll out their 5G strategies. Um, Telstra is currently going through quite a big cost out program at the moment and we've seen early signs of the really heavy competition in mobile and fixed, so predominantly MBN, is starting to abate a little bit. So that's given us a little bit more confidence that the earnings pressure on Telstra is starting to ease somewhat. So uh, we've gone from being underweight Telstra to a modest overweight position in the last few months and you've seen um, Telstra's share price has been rallying. And while the West, rest of the market does look a little bit expensive, as, you know, especially some of those industrials, um, Telstra we like as a defensive position in the portfolio. Thanks, Charles. So that really concludes our presentation today. Um, I'll leave you with our performance on the next slide um, as at the end of April. And we'll just draw your attention to uh, the four buckets, which is how we measure performance across the three shorter cat three shorting categories and our underlying long core fund. So I'll now pass you back to Mark and thank you for your time. Fantastic. Look, thanks gentlemen, and always great to hear your views on the market and, and how you're positioning for portfolios for 2019 and beyond. Just a reminder that all attendees on the webinar today do have the opportunity to ask questions via the internet. This can be done by clicking that questions tab on your screen. Look, while we wait for some questions to come in, I might just touch on some advisor feedback and, and how investors are looking at the Solaris Long Short Fund in portfolios and recap on the platforms and, and researchers. Look, it's interesting. Firstly, the Australian equity market has seen some, some fairly underwhelming performance from a number of long short managers over the last 12 to 18 months, and you've also seen closures of long short managers with the likes of Tribeca and, and other managers approaching or nearing capacity and managing well in excess of a billion dollars in long short strategy. So in terms of our feedback here, you know, what are the differentiating factors that people like about the Solaris Long Short Fund? 
Well, firstly, you've got the comfort that the Solaris long investment process has delivered some consistent outperformance in, in that 16 out of 18 years that, that Damien spoke about. Um, and secondly, you've got a very differentiated and diversified approach to shorting where the team use those outright shorts, the funding shorts and the pairs trades. And finally, um, you've got an investment team that is not only aligned with you by their boutique ownership, but they also have aligned um, their fee in their, uh, in their core process uh, with, with, with investors. We'd also like to say, you know, in terms of summing that up, that, that proofs in the eating and, and the investment returns, certainly since uh, inception with all the Solaris funds have outperformed the index and the Solaris Long Short Fund has outperformed the index by in excess of 7%. Um, from that track record. And then you've got a, a fund manager in the long short space that certainly has a runway of capacity ensuring that the fund's nimble enough to take advantages of opportunities both long and short. We have had a couple of questions come in so we, we might kick off with those. Um, first question guys, in the past you've talked about a sell off in the likes of James Hardy and Aristocrat as uh, long opportunities. These guys have reported. Has anything changed? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, look, we continue to like them both, I guess, in, in summary. Um, James Hardy, firstly, they had a four-year result um, where the result itself was towards the, the lower end of guidance, but still better than, than very low expectations. Um, they didn't sort of give any quantitative guidance for, for next year. Um, that's going to be provided the next quarterly, but management did point to um, modest market growth in the US, uh, market share growth in Australia, and, and also slight growth in, in Europe. But um, some of those pressures, cost pressures, have subsided. Margins are expected to improve um, to the upper end of their guidance range. Um, so we see it as, as good value. Um, it's sort of the outlook is for 15% earnings growth over the next year. That puts them on a pretty undemanding PE of around 16 times, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're continue, happy to continue to hold um, James Hardy, that's for sure. And Aristocrat yesterday had a half-year result that also beat very low expectations. Um, the market has been focused on the outlook for digital business, um, but the cash cows, so the traditional land-based division, which is around 70% of earnings, I believe, they reported another cracking result. The result was really strong. Um, digital, the d digital divi division, um, um, the outlook for the next sort of little bit looks um, pretty strong. Um, we think Aristocrat on 17 times can continue to re-rate um, with continued momentum in that land-based division alone, but also some further upside on the digital division when the market becomes a little bit more um, comfortable with, with the execution in, in that division. Excellent, okay. Um, we've got a numerous questions and I'll summarise this one. It's the hot topic of the week. Um, who are the winners you guys see in the market from the election? Um, that is a, um, a very topical question right now. Um, one way of thinking about it is, you know, the move that we're seeing in the banks and the builders and the retailers insurers, the private hospitals, etc. Um, it's probably more of a relief um, of what could have been under a Labor government rather than any outright winners. Um, you know, so less wage pressures, no negative gearing drag, no cap on private health insurance, no franking credit changes, etc. Um, that's all positive. Um, but look, no doubt, the coalition surprise win definitely removes uncertainty about policy change and this stability um, is real positive for investors and companies. I suppose another way of looking at it is, um, you know, there possibly are a few losers um, of the coalition win, um, so we'll likely have a bit less spending on health, um, a bit less spending on childcare and renewables and the like. Um, so that's a negative for the likes of Chapara Healthcare, uh, Regis, um, SDA Health, who actually just reported a downgrade uh, this morning, um, G8, um, or even uh, AGL in that space. 
Excellent. Okay, guys. Um, back to some stock-specific stuff. Um, Afterpay is trading at all-time highs, another topical stock. Um, would you short it uh, from here? What's your view there? <laughs> pretty, pretty tough one, old Afterpay to short. Um, we're not long, um, so we've missed it from the long side, unfortunately, but we're, we, we, we sort of wouldn't, wouldn't really dare shorting Afterpay and uh, the strong momentum. It's clearly a, a stock that polarises the market. Uh, we certainly can't get in front of the valuation here from the long side, but we also appreciate the opportunity they have in front of them. Um, and, and I guess it's pretty foolish to sort of stand in front of that momentum without a real catalyst for the short. Um, you know, as we sort of mentioned, we like to sort of target some of the other more pedestrian type shorts that are not going to blow us up from the short side, not going to cut our fingers off. Um, and more importantly, then liberate capital that can be reinvested into our um, high conviction long ideas. Um, so we don't really take that hairy chested contrarian approach with our shorts unless there is a strong catalyst in that it might be an earnings downgrade or something like that. Okay. Um, uh, question specifically for you, Gus. Um, given the strong performance of the ASX 200 this year and your expectations for upcoming reporting season, i.e. more earnings downgrades. Do you feel the returns will be more modest, uh, perhaps a, a retracement in the index before the year's end? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, look, we, we are, um, as we sort of mentioned, a little bit cautious of the Australian economy, but also the global economy. And, and it's pretty clear trade wars are having a, a big impact um, around the globe. Overnight we had some manufacturing results from Japan. They've slipped into contraction. Europe have gone further into contraction and the US is sort of on, on the brink of contraction there. So um, that's sort of testament that um, the economy overall is slowing. Um, you, 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 you pair that with the Australian economy which is, um, is also um, struggling a little bit, although there is a bit of relief in, as Damien mentioned, some of those industries that have had it tough for a long time. Um, yeah, we, we are slightly cautious with the Australian market, I guess is a good, good way of saying things. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Okay, guys, um, while we're kind of talking a bit more bigger picture stuff, interest rates look like they're, they're uh, going to be lower sooner. Um, who do you think will be beneficiaries of this and is it priced into valuation? Uh, that's a good question, Mark. Um, so I think looking at the futures curve now, um, the rates guys are pricing in a 100% chance of at least a 25 basis point rate cut for the end of the year and a 75% yeah. chance of two cuts before the end of the um, calendar year. Um, so prima facie, that's positive for equity markets. Um, so you might see a bit more... Uh, relief in the lives of the retailers and the builders, etc. Um, but let's not forget that rates are being cut because momentum in the Australian economy is starting to cool a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, uh, is it in uh, the price? I'd argue that a little bit of it is. Yeah. Um, so, uh, to think about it, um, the other way, if there weren't any rate cuts from here, I think that would be um, that would disappoint investors. Okay. Um, is Macquarie Bank still good value and do you have any insights from Macquarie in their latest report? Yeah, so I guess Macquarie um, had, had a good run into their result. Um, it, it sort of was slightly ahead of expectations or largely in, a, in line with expectations, the result itself. What disappointed was their outlook for financial year 20 um, to be slightly down on financial year 19. Um, however, we think sort of management um, have been, are being conservative, which they historically are, and look after the recent pullback, it's trading better value than it has in the last sort of three years. Uh, we don't think Macquarie are past peak earnings, um, and we're happy to remain long Macquarie, but um, as, we, as we've sort of talked about before, we sort of hedge out that beta risk, that top-down macro risk, that we don't really have too much insight into. Uh, by pairing it against some of the other diversified financials, who surprisingly, despite all the problems, are not trading that much cheaper than Macquarie Bank. Excellent. Look, 
If there's no further questions, we will wrap up the presentation for now. Um, we will be making this webinar available on the Solaris Investment website later today, which is www.solariswealth.com.au. We certainly like to thank everyone for their participation in the, in the webinar. Um, if you do have any further questions, please do not hesitate to look on the Solaris website for our latest fact sheets updates or contact one of the Pinnacle distribution team. Thank you for your time today. We look forward to chatting with you either at our next webinar, luncheon or at a meeting in one of your offices. So thank you very much and have a great day.